Good afternoon, everybody. This is Chip Rogers, President and CEO of the American Hotel and Lodging Association. And thanks for joining us uh, for what is episode number two of our forum series, where we bring you the industry's top thought leaders to talk about a whole host of issues uh, in and around themselves and in and around our industry. And of course, right now, how all of us are dealing uh, with the pandemic. Uh, today, we're very blessed to have two of our industry's top leaders and two gentlemen that are instrumental in leading the American Hotel and Lodging Association and Foundation. We have our chairman, John Bortz, and the chair of the foundation, Greg Ducian. Um, I'll first start with our chairman. He has a long career uh, in our industry. Um, as most of you know, he is the president and CEO of Pebblebrook. Um, and this, of course, is um, one of really our industry's bright, shining stars um, when it comes to top-rated hotels, particularly in resort areas. Um, in fact, Pebblebrook, according to this, is the largest owner of urban and resort lifestyle hotels in the United States. Before that, uh, John had a, a successful career in many things, but one of his key accomplishments, uh, the redevelopment of Grand Central Station in New York City. So there's a little tidbit for you to know about John. Um, also joining him today, Greg Ducian, who is the chair of AHLA's foundation board. Um, obviously, he serves as president and chief operating officer of G6 Hospitality, um, who is one of the nation's fastest growing brands. Um, Greg has a long history working in our industry uh, prior to this at BRE Hotels and also at Interstate Hotels and IHT. So gentlemen, thanks um, so much for joining us today. Um, these are, are trying times and without your leadership, um, AHLA and our membership would be much worse off. So uh, we start by, by thanking you for that. Um, this is really something that we've never seen before. I, I like to mention to all the media folks who seem to want to talk to me about this, that, you know, where we are today is not something that any of us could have financially planned for, and certainly not something any of us could psychologically plan for. Uh, an industry that all of us have known and loved for so long uh, to see the impact that this virus has had on us and the people around us, um, it, it, it leaves an impact um, in, in so many ways. And I want to get into that. But first, um, what we'd love to do is is actually get to know both of you gentlemen so much uh, better than we do now. We see you on the front of things like Lodging Magazine. We see you uh, speaking at events back when we had in-person events. Um, the folks that are watching this today certainly know you and your leadership here at HLA. Um, but I want to get to know you a little bit better, at least allow others to as well. So first, quick, easy question. John, we'll start with you. What was your first paying job? Not the first job you had to work because your parents said so, but the first one you actually got paid for. So my first paying job was uh, at a country club, maintaining tenant hard through tennis courts and stringing tennis rackets. And I came from a family of tennis players, and I played tennis myself, and uh, they taught me how to string tennis rackets, and I, I still have the uh, damage on my fingers to prove that I did it for, I did it for about five years. I started at the age of 14. And, and when you started, what did they pay you? I got paid a dollar, I think it was a dollar a tennis racket, and I got paid something like a dollar sixty-five an hour, which was the minimum wage back then. That's, Sorry, that seems like yeah, that seems like a while ago, John. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, what almost, about you? Almost fifty years. <laughs> wow. Uh, well, John, you were cheap, cheap labor, I guess. I, I uh, started, I was a bus busser at a small lakeside resort in Maine, so food and beverage. All right, so I'm going to ask one that's not on my sheet here, and I had it on my original sheet. My staff took it off, so I'm putting it back on because I love this question. What was your first car? Greg, start with you. I'm sorry, what was your question? What was your first car? At, at, oh, my teenager? first car. Yeah. Man, I'll, I'll never live this down. I had a, uh, a Toyota Camry station wagon that belonged to my mother. And uh, if you want to get ridiculed in high school, uh, get the hand-me-down with a station wagon and you're there. John, John, what about you? Well, I can't answer that because it's one of the passwords on some of these uh, financial <laughs> websites. But my, <laughs> my, my first car was obviously also a hand-me-down. It was a 63 Dodge Dart with, uh, with uh, 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 the shift on the column. Nice. And the heating and air conditioning was through the open rusted floor 
um, below where I was sitting. I, I tell my kids that all the time. If you can drive a, 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 a stick shift on the column, you can drive anything. So um, mine was a 71 Ford Maverick, which was probably just as bad or worse than your guys. Um, hotel industry. Um, obviously, both of you started your first job serving others, which of course led you to where you are today. But what, what got you interested in creating a career in this particular industry? Um, Greg, we'll start with you. You know, I used to travel. Uh, my, my father was a business person and he took trips and occasionally the family would have the honor of traveling along. And, and he was a, a big fan of convention hotels, the big boxes. And when you're a kid and you walk into those hotels, it's just magic, at least it was for me. And later on in, in my teens, I found out that there were actually colleges where you could get degrees in hotel <laughs> management. I couldn't believe that when I heard that. And so I jumped at the chance of doing that. And I've, I've been doing it ever since. I, I've enjoyed hotels from the day I got into them and still liking them today. It is, without a doubt. And I've been in a number of industries, the best industry, no, no question. Uh, John, what about you? What, what, what took you from stringing tennis rackets to saying, I, I want to be in the hotel industry? I'm not sure I ever said I wanted to be in the hotel industry. <laughs> um, and after this year, I'm pretty sure I don't want to be in it. Um, but... Uh, I got into the hotel industry by chance. I mean, I, I, I was doing commercial real estate development. You mentioned Grand Central Terminal. I, I, uh, I moved to Washington to oversee the redevelopment of, of Union Station here in DC. I was doing a lot of mixed use public private partnerships and uh, development kind of died with the, uh, with the economic crash and real estate recession of, of the early 90s. And I started doing workouts for clients and one of them happened to be a hotel that was being built and we did this study for them. They had lots of problems. They asked us to take over the development and then the asset management after it opened. That, that hotel today is the Four Seasons New York City uh, on 57th. And, and um, we thought, hey, there must be a lot of other involuntary owners of hotels and, uh, and, and so let's go around and, and uh, uh, get hired to provide advice. And then once we knew something about the business, because I didn't, I wasn't doing hotels, um, maybe we could go raise some money to invest in hotels. And what we found is nobody wanted to hire us to advise them, but we found capital that was ready to invest, even though, frankly, we didn't know anything about hotels. <laughs> so hired a couple of fellows to so a couple of people to start the business and we started making investments in hotels in, in 1994. And, and here we are in 2020 and you're, you're still doing quite well. We want to talk about that and your, your team and, and, and where you are in just a second. But one last kind of get to know you question. Um, you guys are both leaders in our industry. There's no question about it. Leaders with AHLA. Uh, there are a lot of people who would love to spend time with you and talk to you and pick your brain and find out what you're thinking about where we are in the world today. But I want to flip that a little bit and ask you, who would you like to have dinner with in our industry? What industry leader would you like to have dinner with to spend time just talking about, about life and, and the industry and everything associated with it? John, we'll go with you first. <laughs> Outside of you and Greg? <laughs> yeah, of course. Present <laughs> company ex exempted, yeah. Um, so I'm going to stretch this a little bit, if, if I can, Chip. Um, sure. Because I, I guess in a way I'm a little fortunate. I, I've had an opportunity to spend a lot of time with leaders in the industry. Um, I, there's a fellow who's peripherally in the business who I would love to have dinner with, and that's Bill Gates. And uh, you know he he does invest in luxury hotels. He's invested in Four Seasons and 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 other uh, uh, luxury properties. And I'd love to uh, I'd love to spend time with him. Not only understand why is he in hotel, why is he investing in hotels, but just you know the 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 charity work that he does, the philanthropic work that he does, the Gates issue, and obviously what they spend a lot of time on today is is uh, the the issues of finding a vaccine and and therapeutics. So, but I think he'd be a fascinating person to uh, to have dinner with. Greg, what about you? Yeah, Bill Gates is a good one. I've, I've got a, a different kind of visionary. Um, it's too late to have dinner with him, but that's uh, Walt Disney. I just think uh, his vision is something that we'd all be lucky to have as business leaders. And if I, could, if I could cheat as well and add a second person to the list, somebody that I'm not too late to have dinner with 
uh, that would be Bill Marriott, who's now 88 until very recently. Uh, I mean, the focus he has on guests and on employees day in and day out for over the three decades that I've been in the business is something that I take a lot away from. It's very inspiring. To me. So, uh, those two for me. Yeah, he certainly, uh, he created the standard that even to this day, people try to live up to and uh, we're all better off because he did so and uh, incredible leader. Great. Um, and to John's point, I, I did have the opportunity not to have dinner, but to, to, to speak with Gates in a, in a group of about 10 people for a couple hours. And uh, he's an incredibly bright man with a lot of ideas and a lot of subjects, uh, but, but two great answers there. Um, Greg, you, um, you know, we, we talked about what you've done in your career. Um, everyone knows your role in G6. You know, what we've seen out of G6 over the last few years has, has been pretty amazing up, up until this year. I mean, the growth and the trajectory of what G6 was doing and expanding your footprint um, was really the envy of many. Um, how have you and your organization switched from a scenario where you're in hyper growth, you're growing and, and, and things are going great to dealing with this pandemic? And, and, and what have you done operationally to, to be able to work with your team in what amounts to really a different environment? Well, because we didn't have a chance to do it earlier, I'm happy to talk about G6. But, but Chip, I just wanted to say thanks to you and your incredible team for all that you're doing. Uh, what you're doing representing us, whether it's in the White House or on the Hill or in the 50 states, along with the state associations, it's so needed right now. And on behalf of a grateful industry, um, we all appreciate it. So I wanted to begin by saying that. Um, I'm also appreciative that you recognize uh, and call out G6's outstanding trajectory. As you mentioned, we're the parent company for the Motel 6 and the Studio 6 Extended Stay brands. There's 1,400 plus of these all around North America. And we've had a great run here these last few years. I was fortunate uh, to join the company just over two years ago. And even though the company is nearly 60 years old and has a great legacy of success, we, our, our mission was uh, to basically reinvent the company, to adapt it and mature it, because we all felt that there was another level uh, of success to be obtained. And whether that's everything from uh, changing how we drive revenues to provide consistency for guests or the prototypes and the products that we put out there that the guests sleep in every night, launched a couple of those as well. Um, we got a chance to look at everything anew and that's a chance of a lifetime to do a brand like this. It's a, it's a really talented executive committee led by one of the great CEOs in our industry, Rob Pleshi. Rob, Rob has been here a year, uh, got this journey started where I got here and is doing a great job leading it. And I would just say we've done, I think, made two very uh, early strategic decisions to get to your question that have served us well before COVID, but are also serving us well through COVID. And the first, which is in contrast, I think, to most of the industry, we decided that we were going to only focus on our two brands. We've had chances to acquire brands or, or to merge brands in or uh, to, to uh, build brands, create them, or even to expand globally. And we've just that temptation, deciding that we really needed to stick to our knitting and expand what we believe is our lead in the economy segment. So I would say first, we just stuck to our knitting. We're, uh, we're focusing on a very simple value proposition. And then the second thing that we did is we separated the company into two divisions. One for our owned and managed real estate. We are one of the few brands that still owns and manage. We have over 250 hotels a day. And then for our 1,200 franchise uh, hotels, which are really small businesses. Some of these owners may have one hotel with us, some have 30 or 40, but that's a separate division of the company. And so what it's enabled us to do, rather than being one big group that I think was good at both, we now can focus and be great at each. And the way it served us well in COVID is in the owned, for, in the owned and managed group, for example, we could put policies in overnight unilaterally, we come up with a great idea. We wanna make it uh, in the hotels by tomorrow. We're quick and nimble and decisive and off we go. Whereas in the franchise business, it's a different skill set. We have to get with each of those owners and figure out they're in different geographies. They have different issues, how we can support them better. And so our franchise team has take a very, taken a very individualistic approach to help each of these entrepreneurs get there. It's helping with PPP, or how to deal with COVID-related issues or social investment. So uh, those are the two things that I think have, have served us well and will continue to serve us going. You mentioned uh, your CEO, Rob Pelleschi. As I, as I think about all of the, 
the large industry events that we no longer get to go to, everything's moved digitally. I often think about Rob because he's the one panelist that everybody wants because he's honestly one of the funniest guys in our industry. Uh, and he, no matter what panel he's on, I always end up laughing. Um, but, uh, but but really, uh, not only a true leader, but but a really funny guy. Um, John, you're, you're, saying, you're saying he's funnier than me. No, of course not. I would never, <laughs> ever say that. Uh, nor would I even imply that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's what um, I... So, John, you're in a little bit different situation, obviously, um, being a publicly traded company, um, also having many assets, iconic assets in large cities, many of which remain shut down to this day. Um, and you and your your employees, uh, an incredible team you have there at Pebblebrook, they've been severely impacted, uh, perhaps more than most by this. How have you dealt with seeing that type of revenue loss uh, to your company and even the psychological impact it has on a, on a professional team like yours that is dealing with a whole new world? So we, we started with a group crying session. <laughs> we wanted to get that out of our system to start with. And, uh, and then we talked about the fact that we've been through cycles before. Our, our leadership team's been through cycles. Our, our senior leaders within the organization who oversee and work with our operators on a daily basis have been through these uh, unfortunate events before. And, and yes, this one is much worse, but they all have the same thing in common, right? They, as you said, there's both a, there's both a financial impact, there's an operating impact, and there's a psychological impact uh, that it has. And I think there's a period up front, um, in, in a way, you're, you're, first you're focused on what you have to do. And we, we had a game plan that we've used in other cycles that we rolled out. You know, the first thing is um, protect, protect the company, protect the assets, um, uh, mitigate your damages, and also understand that well, however bad you think it, it, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot worse. <laughs> and, and that's what we've lived through in prior cycles. And so we started out with the idea that this is, uh, you could see it coming. Um, we got started earlier in, in early March uh, in, and even uh, late February in some cases. And when you bring the team together and, and, and the first thing you say is, look, we've been through this before. Um, we have the resources to get through it again. Here are the things we're gonna do. Here are the sacrifices we're looking for. Here are the sacrifices we're willing to make. Uh, and, and we start with the leadership saying, we haven't talked to the board, but we're going to propose we all take less money. I'm going to propose that I don't get a salary this year. Um, we're going to ask for a lot of sacrifices at the property level. Leadership has to lead. We have to show that we're willing to do work harder and for less money at the end of the day with more impact on us than what we're asking other people to do. And I think once you get past that understanding and people understand. I mean, we went around and asked people, what are you willing to give up? We didn't dictate to people at the beginning. We wanted to understand, if you understand what's going on, you know what we're gonna be asking our property team. We're gonna close assets in days um, from a phone call to it being closed. We're gonna, we're gonna furlough a lot of people. We're gonna ask people to do things they maybe haven't done in 20 years when they got into the industry. Um, and, and so I think part of it is getting everybody's mind, right? Making sure people feel comfortable. You know, one of the things we said was our plan is not to lay anybody off at Pebble Brook, but in order to do that, everybody's going to, going to need to make financial sacrifices because that's how you keep the team together because we want to keep the team together. And, and so we did, uh, we did rally around that, uh, at the end of the day. I think that the interesting thing today with, with this uh, chip, as hard as it is, and look, we went from a billion six in annual revenues to an annual run rate of about $50 million. Wow. In three weeks. Jeez. And that's, it's pretty, um, it, it, it's unimaginable, right? When you, um, when it was unimaginable, <laughs> Um, going through it, it's still unimaginable talking about it. You know, we were, we were making um, a million and a half dollars a day and 
you know, at the bottom of this in, 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 uh, in late April into early May, we're losing a million dollars a day. Um, unfortunately, we had arranged for enough liquidity availability to get through it. And that was part of the original, you know, discussions that we had. We're going to get through this. Even if this goes on for a couple of years, we're going to be able to get through it. We're low levered um, at, at the end of the day. But I think the opportunity, if you know, that, that always comes out of these downturns. It's out of necessity, right? Inventions, the mother, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And so we're, we're doing truly zero based budgeting um, because when you close a hotel and then you reopen it, we're running these hotels completely differently than we were before. I mean, we have GMs checking people in. We have directors of sales cleaning rooms. Why? Because we want to keep them um, and that expertise. And, and, uh, but at the end of the day, there's nothing for them to sell right now. The GM doesn't have anybody to manage. So everybody's got to go back to their roots and do something differently. But zero budgeting means that not only during this, I, I hope it's a transitionary period back to some level of normalcy uh, in, in a year or two years, whatever it takes, these businesses are going to be run differently uh, than they were before. They're going to be run more efficiently um, because they're going to have to be um, uh, because of our, our need to have to basically repay all the debt we have to take on to get through this period of time. Um, and we're going to use technology differently and the customer's uh, desires are going to be different. And we're going to have to take that all into account as we, reopen these hotels and we learn how to run them again. And one of the benefits we have at Pebblebrook is we work with, today we have 18 different operators of our 54 hotels. So we get best practices from everybody. And we had a great best practice program that to some extent we throw out the window and we, and we start building a whole new best practices book because we have to do things differently now. And, and being able to to basically utilize all the great ideas from 18 different operators is extremely beneficial um, to us. You, you talked um, a lot about guest experience and boy, if I, if I went back and looked at the last 20 uh, of these um, large events in our industry that happened before the pandemic, I think that's a topic uh, in every one of them. What is the guest experience like? We're always as an industry trying to figure out how do we improve the guest experience? Tell me what you think the guest experience is going to be, both in the short term and long term. And I define short term and long term this way. The short term is pre-coronavirus vaccine, and this is assuming we have a vaccine, but pre-coronavirus vaccine. And then long term, what's, what's the lasting effect going to be on the guest experience even after there's a vaccine? You want me to start or? All yours, yes, oh, and then we'll go to Greg. Well, you know, our, our focus as a company is on the experiential. I mean, that's what the lifestyle, the ownership of lifestyle hotels and the creation of lifestyle hotels is all about. And um, I think the, the, uh, the challenge that we've presented to our team and the operators that we work with is how do you go from a high touch model uh, and experience through design and the creation of these dynamic and vibrant uh, social spaces. Uh, and how do you go from that to a low or no touch experience um, without utilization of many of those spaces that you've created, whether it's restaurants or it's event spaces or it's a combination or it's dynamic lobby areas or other public areas, game rooms in our properties uh, as an example. Um, and, and it involves a lot of personalization. Um, it involves meeting people's needs, even if we have to meet them differently. So, okay, we might not be coming in to clean your room during your stay, but that doesn't mean we're not giving you any service. We're still gonna provide you service. It's just gonna be contactless. So you check in, you get all this nice PPP, you get a nice uh, glad bag, for your garbage, because you're probably going to be eating a lot of stuff in your room uh, that you that you've brought in from elsewhere or from our own facility if it happens to be open. 
And you know what? Give us a call, put it in the bag. We'll come by and pick it up. And we'll put another bag on the door and you'll take that. You want towels? We'll get you more towels. You want, you want to change your linens like you do at home? Here's a new set of linens. If that, whatever's important to you, um, understanding what, if you're traveling, and that's why, I, you know, in my calls at the end, I've always said to people, look, I, I, I understand what's going on with the pandemic, but you're in the travel business. You want to understand what's going on and how you're going to react to it. You need to travel. You mm -hmm. can't do it from your bedroom watching CNN or Fox News. You, you will have a work perspective of the world. Um, and so get out, see what it's like, take a trip, see how the customers are reacting. It may surprise you how they react. And so the challenge really is, I mean, you see the property behind me, which is open, the marker in Key West right now, assuming it doesn't get, Key West doesn't shut down again. Um, and what are people looking for? How do we give them that, that luxury experience uh, for a vacation, which they desperately want to need, but we can't do it the same way we did before. And that's the challenge. And those are the things we're figuring out as we go along. Greg, what about you with, with G6? What's the customer experience looking like differently today? And then if you could touch on, what do you think survives this as far as structural change in our industry? I mean, how is that experience going to differ even post vaccine where things hopefully would get closer to normal? Yeah, I think the, the experience today uh, is not all that unlike what it's been in the past. We've all put in enhanced cleaning. We've all got the right chemicals. We've all got public attendance cleaning left, right, and center every 30 minutes. We're all asking for social distancing and face masks. And frankly, I think uh, it's harder to differentiate from economy to luxury today because all those other amenities like restaurants and meeting rooms aren't available. So we're all at the moment a little bit homogenized. I think in the long run, how it looks is really gonna be dependent on how the public perceives travel in the future. John couldn't be further, uh, you know, what he said, it couldn't be further from, from, from the truth. You gotta get out there and see. And every individual is going to make up his or her mind on how they feel about germs going forward, whether it's in their personal lives or in their travel lives. And I believe the, it's not yet written in stone how hotel brands and managers uh, respond because we don't know if they're gonna wanna get back into big groups. We don't know if they're gonna be comfortable with hotels with shared amenities or large lobbies. And I would just say, lastly, I, I think what's a little bit ironic here, uh, and I, I know I'm gonna be accused of being uh, slanted toward economy here, but uh, what's old is, is new again, right? If you go back a year ago and you talked about a hotel with a small lobby, that would be perceived as a negative. Or you talked about a hotel that didn't have a restaurant or uh, you know, maybe a hotel where there's not a lot of case goods or a, a shared amenities in the room. Or no, in, no interior corridors, motels are, are back. Right, <laughs> motels are back, right? All of a sudden having your own air conditioning unit that has not got circulated air, shared air, is a positive, and and so uh, I think you know to some degree, John, you're right. It's uh, what's old is new again, and uh, in part, I think part of the decent performance of the economy, at least relative to a suffering industry right now, is because uh, we offer what guests want, and you add to that lower prices, and you have a good value problem. I think, hey, Chip, the one thing I would I, I would address, which I which I didn't in your question, is sort of the post pandemic. I, I truly believe in my heart, and we're we're as transparent, and I think as as good at maybe looking at the future and trying to understand where things are going to go. And we certainly aren't aren't experts at it, but I, I do think um, if we can, if, if the health community, the pharmaceutical or biological community, comes up with a solution that mitigates the outcome, uh, meaning. You're not going to die any more often than you die from anything. Um, you're not going to end up in the hospital. You're going to have a treatment. It's going to be more like the flu or something similar. I think people go back to where they were. That's where they wanted to be. Now, will there will there there'll always be people who have high anxiety, who are germaphobes already, you know, who may change their behaviors. But I think the vast majority of the population around the world 
wants to do what they were doing before. We, we've proven that in the last month, reopening states, that so many people have given up these important regimens that are recommended um, because they, don't, they really don't want to do them, right? We want to go back to the way we were, sort of carefree, uh, if you will, and or at least understanding what the risks were. And, and that's what we don't know right now. So I do think travel gets back. I think our industry will be a little different. I think we'll do things more efficiently. I think banquets will be different. I think there'll be more prep and less fancy cooking. I think it'll probably be healthier too uh, at the end of the day. So I do think those things will change um, and, and those are changes for the good. And some of these things, the, the, the adoption of technology, of mobile check-in, of of uh, probably uh, uh, concierges through video screens or even checking through a video screen if you need help. I, I think all we're doing is like any other industry, this speeds up this transference or this transition to the next phase of greater use of technology. No, no question about it. I think you're exactly right. And I, I, I do in many ways share your belief that uh, when the environment seems normal, we will return to those activities that we freely chose to do prior to the pandemic. And, and that is a, a society that engages on a human level with each other. I think humans need that. And I think we'll see that again. Um, Greg, one of the uh, real challenges that our country has faced during this time is not just the, uh, the economic struggles, the uncertainty uh, questions that we all kind of wrestle with in our mind over, over where are we going um, as a society, but then you layer on top of this much of the social unrest that has happened uh, just over the last three months. Um, and it makes for, boy, it, it's, again, psychologically very challenging time for a lot of people. Um, you see suicide rates increasing, which is extremely sad because people are, are looking around the world or, or at the world around them and saying to themselves that I don't know where I fit in or, or what's happening or what, what tomorrow looks like. Um, you guys just did something I, I want to commend you on, um, and, and um, I think it's really important. You joined with Harvard, of all places, um, who's not having a football season this fall, by the way, um, to work on a new diversity and inclusion-focused program, and it was some team members through G6 that really made this happen. Tell us about this. I know a little bit about it. I'm very excited about that, but I want, to, I want you to kind of announce it and, and let us know what's happening. Yeah, sure. Ha happy to. And I mean, first, I would say that, you know, we're all hospitality folks and we're not political by nature. We got into this business because we want to serve each other and serve our guests. And what's going on in our country and in the globe, for that matter, it's heartbreaking for all of us. And we're all trying to figure out what role we can play in making this a better world. Our, um, you know, our view is that, um, you know, we have one of the most diverse industries that's out there. And we've got to figure out how to get along. And regardless of whatever people's political or personal views are, or how you feel about defunding police, as an example, um, we are always, always have and always will as an industry need to have local community partnerships. And, and part of that community partnership is figuring out how to work with law enforcement. We're not going to be able to interview people and figure out why they're here or what they're up to. We're certainly not a judge or a jury. Um, and so ultimately, there's always going to be a few hundred people sleeping upstairs with a dozen staff members downstairs. Things are going to happen, and we're going to need to be able to call somebody. And until somebody comes up with a better solution, that today is law enforcement. And so at G6, you know, we wrestled with this. We've come to the conclusion that really the best way forward is for people of color and law enforcement to continue to work together to find the right solutions. It's not help one and not the other. They're going to have to work together. And as a business community, we're going to have to help create organizations to make that happen and possible. And to that end, uh, our general counsel and chief compliance officer, Emma Romain, who's a terrific individual and an amazing executive, uh, and a Howard Law alum, uh, not Harvard, just to be, to be oh, clear, good. Howard, Howard in your neck of the woods in DC. Yeah. Uh, has I'm glad you cleared that up. Yeah. Yeah. To, has co founded an amazing organization. It's called the Initiative uh, Advancing the Black and Blue Partnership. And what it is, is it's, it's an advocacy group of business professionals, law enforcement professionals, some academics from ha uh, Howard uh, Law and others who are coming together to promote uh, trust building and scalable policing models all throughout the country. 
we believe that this is a great opportunity for our industry and, and for all industries that matter, and therefore have co-sponsored, uh, or founding co-sponsor along with Microsoft and others. And we think and hope it'll do great things um, for the business community. So for anybody who's interested in checking out, we're short on time today, but there's a website you can go and you can look. It's blackandbluepartnership.org. And I would certainly encourage you to check it out. That's outstanding. Thank you. Um, and I'm glad it's Howard, not Harvard. I know uh, John's a pen guy, so he's, he's glad as, as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, John, you've been to the West Coast uh, a lot lately. We all love going to the West Coast. The scenery is, is gorgeous. I think uh, President Reagan said it best, and that is he, he once mentioned that if the, uh, if the pilgrims had landed on the West Coast, the East Coast would still be undeveloped. Um, but there are some challenging policy struggles that we see pop up on the West Coast. And right now, uh, one that is very dangerous for our industry is happening in the city of San Francisco at a time when, when hotels are literally trying to keep their doors open and stay in business. Um, a, a group of elected officials have seen fit to adopt policies that make it even more difficult for those hotels to survive. Tell us a little bit about that and then more uh, uh, about how we as an industry uh, can stay united in making sure that this doesn't happen elsewhere. Yeah, so um, I, I think this is an unfortunate outgrowth of uh, what continues to be a uh, a non-collaborative relationship between the industry and the union uh, that represents uh, hospitality workers. And, uh, you know, the, the idea we're all in it together, you know, that's what we all, we've all said, this is something impacting uh, mankind, regardless of race, um, uh, regardless of uh, economic outcome. Uh, it may unfortunately be hitting some harder than others, but it it knows uh, no no barrier, and so I think unfortunately, um, what what our uh, effectively contract discussions have, have got moved into the political arena uh, at the desire of the union, and I think uh, unfortunately what it's led to is a set of cleaning requirements that the board of supervisors passed in San Francisco, uh, written by. Uh, Unite Here and SEIU that applies to hotels and office buildings in San Francisco, although interestingly, does not apply to city buildings, county buildings, or state buildings, which evidently, perhaps they don't care about the health of the people who work in those buildings. If, oh, no, they're, they're clean, John. Those buildings are really clean. If this is truly <laughs> a, about, about protecting health. And Unfortunately, the requirements uh, that, that are part of this ordinance um, actually, we believe, actually uh, put the associate and the guest at greater risk uh, to the virus because it involves cleaning every day a, a guest room. Uh, it, it involves cleaning public spaces almost constantly, uh, whether front of house or back of house, which means being uh, having people uh, exposed all day long to cleaning solutions and and and, and uh, fumes and other odors and things like that, uh, and of course being being exposed to more areas potentially uh, for the virus. And so, uh, despite the program that our industry, Chip, you and your team have put together with with uh, with the uh, strong involvement of all of the major brands in the in the uh, in the world uh, in the hotel business. And, uh, uh, and the small brands and, and operators in our industry and at the recommendations of the CDC, they passed a law that goes long beyond uh, CDC requirements. And in fact, we believe does put the employees at greater risk. And, and so uh, unfortunately, um, this is something that uh, we're just gonna have to see how it plays out. Hopefully, um, uh, there'll be a resolution and more of a collaboration. Uh, this uh, law was drafted without input from the industry. It was also drafted without the input from the health community um, and the scientific community. So, uh, so we're now uh, legislating that the health orders as opposed to the health departments doing that. And what it means in San Francisco, frankly, is, and we still only have two of 12 hotels open in San Francisco, we have about 10% of the rooms in the market. 
Um, what it means is the two that we have open will probably have to close, um, both because of the, the greater risk to the employees. There's also a civil, uh, uh, there's an ability for anyone to sue, uh, which of course is uh, wonderful for the plaintiffs far uh, and, and for the union. And then uh, in addition to that, it'll mean that what's not open is likely to take much longer to open because we've raised the break even point between staying closed and opening to a greater level. So it means we need more occupancy levels. We need more revenues in the, in the industry, in that market, um, which is still at very, very low levels. So our hotels are running about uh, between five and 10% uh, occupancy in the market. And uh, uh, this will cause ours as an example to likely close. And if this spreads to other cities, which is um, I, I don't think it's the objective necessarily of the union to have this all legislated. I think they're looking for some uh, resolution of, of employment issues or labor issues, many of which we can't control because we don't control demand here uh, at, at, at the end of the day. So uh, this is very troubling for the industry. It could affect many cities around the U.S., it means we can't bring our employees back. Um, it means we can't open as quickly. Um, it means fewer revenues for the city, which means they can pursue fewer of their uh, social agenda uh, objectives. Well, it is, uh, it's almost mind boggling that a city that has a global reputation for the challenges it, it faces just cleaning its own streets somehow uh, felt that they knew how hotels should be cleaned and, and, and ultimately it will probably uh, result in fewer hotels being able to operate. It's just, uh, it's, well, it's a, city, a, a city with the, uh, their desire. They, they've stated that they believe if they have the, the cleanest hotels that more people will come to San Francisco. And, uh, and, and I guess that means they'd walk over um, the, the quality of life issues in the streets, as you say. You know, it was interesting. We had a conversation today with our team and, uh, you know, we all participate in these business improvement districts. Well, we're the ones actually cleaning a good part of the city uh, at this point, and we're paying for it. And in addition, um, the city wants to obligate us to do even more cleaning beyond uh, what's uh, necessary or safe. Um, and in fact, our, our business improvement districts also employ police uh, individuals because the police don't respond to what we would all describe as, as uh, issues that affect quality of life and desire for people to come visit a city. So looting, as an example, graffiti, um, oh, I don't know, uh, human uh, uh, defecating on the streets, um, uh, uh, using, um, uh, shooting up in the streets um, with, with needles being provided by the city, um, uh, tents everywhere uh, for the for the for the homeless uh, that the city is unable to take care of, and so I feel like all of these cities really need to understand the best way to achieve what we all want to achieve, which is a wonderful place to live and work, and have people come visit, is to do it together in a collaborative way, as Greg was talking about. Our community involvement in these cities is huge. Our teams are all involved in charities in these markets. We pay for the bid, we pay for police. Our revenues go for all these services. And yet we don't even have a seat at the table in these cities. And I think it's, it's terribly unfortunate. And it's also, uh, it, it also leads to a much poorer outcome for everyone. So the clock has caught up with us. We have time for one more question. And the last question is really gonna focus on the dual roles that you two gentlemen play. You both lead incredible organizations. And at the same time, you have a leadership role here at HLA and the foundation. I wanna start with Greg. Um, the foundation uh, is well known for, for doing the industry's work with respect to creating that workforce, educating our workforce, providing workforce opportunities. It's, it's incredible work that has put our industry in a place that I don't think any other industry can be. Um, we, you know, the opportunity that exists in our industry doesn't exist in other industries, and we should all be proud of that. You, of course, in your leadership role at G6, but you also have your leadership role here with the HLA Foundation. 
if you could, with our last question here, talk a little bit about the, the work of the foundation and keeping those employees engaged in our industry because we know them staying in our industry is critically important to our future. Yeah, thanks, Chip. It, it's so important. And, and most of the work there for most of the credit really needs to go to Rosanna Maeda and her incredible team at the foundation, that's Shelly and Kara and others who are, are inspiring to me. I mean, they wake up every day trying to figure out how we can create jobs and careers in our industry uh, for people, many of which uh, who've never been exposed to our industry. And the challenge for us, of course, is when a big part of what you do at the foundation is to create career pathing. And hotels are worried about surviving. Certainly, they're not going to be hiring interns and, and adding jobs, cutting jobs. Uh, we had to do things differently, right? So we had to immediately pivot. We knew on day one, and we began thinking about how are we going to keep our mission alive during COVID in what we all knew was going to be the toughest time in the history. And what we came up with um, was keeping people engaged in our business, our employees, whether they were working or whether they were out of work, moment or food, we wanted to keep them tethered to the industry and preferably to their employers. And so we partnered with a very good educational institute. Uh, they do all the training for the industry, outstanding group. And together we made training free for the period of time during COVID. And what happened after we did that was amazing, far exceeded anyone's expectations. So far during COVID, we've put more than 20,000 people through free training. That's 28,000 courses, anything from English as a second language to associate degree courses to certifications and uh, their specialty, uh, just in a matter of months. It's more than three and a half million dollars of educational value. And I believe, though it may be a minute before these folks get back to work, when they do come back to work, they're going to be able to use these skills, not just to be better at their roles that they left this week, but the roles uh, that they're coming back with hope to provide a career path. Yeah, to think about at a time like this, when the industry is facing the worst financial hit we've ever taken, that our foundation was able to give away three and a half million dollars worth of education to employees and, and team members in our industry. That's just an amazing story. And, 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 you know, there's so much negativity around everything we do these days to hear things like that ought to put a smile on everyone's face. So um, certainly thank you for your leadership there. And, and you're right, Rosanna and their, their team, um, they, they make it happen on a daily basis. Uh, Mr. Chairman uh, Boards, I will close with you. So I'll take you back uh, a few months ago. We were uh, both together, all of us were together uh, in late January in Los Angeles, California. And a dear friend of ours, Jeff Bellotti, um, was finishing his term as chair of HLA and probably the most successful year HLA has ever had. And he handed you that gavel. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure there were thoughts going through your head as to what that year would look like. Um, and that's clearly much different today. So what has the first six months of, of being chair of HLA, what's it been like? Um, and, and how do you um, relate that to the industry as a whole in your business as well? What, what, what's that been like? What's this experience of playing those dual roles been like? It's been like six years, Chip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> um, it's certainly winning the lottery. <laughs> uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the year uh, I get to participate in this role. But it, as you know, we participate for oh, I don't, five or six years in, in leadership roles within the uh, association. And, and so uh, for me, um, uh, I, I feel fortunate to be able to um, participate and help the industry in even just a little way, because we know who does the work. It's you and your team. I really do the work uh, at the end of the day, and, and uh, we help make sure the train's on the tracks and, and doesn't get too far off and, and, uh, and, and utilize the, the, uh, the roles that we have to, to try to influence people um, for, for our objectives, to meet our objectives. But I think for me, I mean, one, I'm not a politician, and everybody, everybody who knows me knows that uh, I'm not very good at, um, I don't know, slanting uh, the facts uh, at, at the end of the day. And so it's been a fascinating part, but I truly believe that we've, we've had an incredible impact. And I, and I say I've had a tiny little role, but we've had, as an association, we've had an incredible impact on the industry this year in a positive way. I mean, the, the, 
the the uh, legislation that was passed in Congress that provided for um, TPP loans, and while not perfectly structured, much more available than had it been done the way they were originally contemplating, um, where uh, we were able to get it applicable to individual properties uh, at the end of the day as a small business, regardless of how many properties you might own uh, or, or operate. I, I think that was great. Even the most important thing, you know, participating as we did um, in, in getting this, this uh, uh, unemployment insurance on steroids for our, uh, for our workers who are unemployed today, and, and many of which will be unemployed for quite some time, uh, given the length of this pandemic. So for me, it's been very rewarding um, to feel that we could participate and make things better in, in our, one, our little way uh, at the end of the day, but, but working together with your team with Greg, with the other officers, with the other members of the executive committee and the board, I, I feel very fortunate uh, to be able to do it. And, and while it takes a lot longer than Bilotti said, um, uh, I feel like he needs to come around again um, based upon uh, what, what, what he told me. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he lives a charmed life. There's no question about it. Um, look, gentlemen, I, I can't thank you enough for your leadership. Uh, and John, I think uh, what you mentioned uh, there, and, and Greg, also your, your your statement about helping our employees in this industry, um, you both play a, a much more important role than you indicated in leading us through an extremely difficult time. You, you look back historically at the, even the challenging times we've had in our nation, and you think that you, you think about the leaders that got it, got us through it, the guys like Abraham Lincoln at a time when the, the nation was crumbling, and 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 so I wouldn't underestimate your your role here. Um, but I do know this, is that because of your efforts and because of the efforts the association and foundation are making, um, everybody in hospitality has a little bit better fighting chance to make it through this. And so we certainly appreciate you uh, for doing that. Um, we are out of time, but we're going to do this again. So I hope everyone watching has enjoyed this. Um, this will be available in a digital format, no question about that. But we'll also be doing this here in a couple of weeks with two more uh, outstanding leaders. And we'll continue to bring these forum series to you. Um, to really get you to understand what's going through the leaders of our industry, what's going through their mind, a little bit more about them and, and where we're all headed. So thanks for watching today. We certainly appreciate it. And we'll see you again very soon.